Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm John Diamond, the president of the UMaine Alumni Association. Uh, welcome and hope you and your loved ones are safe and healthy wherever you are. We know we have individuals joining us today from around the country, and we're really pleased that you're able to take part in tonight's webinar. Uh, this webinar is a part of a series that the Alumni Association has been conducting over the past seven months. Uh, the topics have covered a wide variety of issues, both scholarly and entertainment, informational, uh, uh, social and, and uh, public policy issues. And we've been able to feature some great faculty experts from the University of Maine, as well as some uh, established, well-established uh, professionally uh, alums of the University of Maine, some campus administrators, and of course, uh, UMaine students. These webinars have proved to be quite popular and we've decided that we're planning to continue to offer them uh, as a regular part of our programming. Tonight's topic is a timely one and it's uh, interpreting the 2020 elections. And the person providing the interpretation tonight is the University of Maine's 2020 Distinguished Maine Professor Honoree political science professor Richard Powell. Some of you may recall that in October, Dr. Powell and his colleague, uh, Dr. Rob Glover, participated in another one of our webinars. That one was titled Politics in America. Dr. Glover was going to join us for tonight's evening uh, webinar as well, but unfortunately he became ill and is unable to do so. So this evening, it's all Dr. Powell and you. If you'd like to pose any questions to him, there's an easy way to do that. Just take a look at the bottom of your computer screen, your Zoom screen. You'll see a little cartoon speaking bubble. Uh, that's the chat button. We've all become pretty familiar with that uh, during the Zoom era of this year. Uh, just uh, type in your question, hit the enter or return key on your keyboard, and we'll get to as many of your questions as possible during the time that we have available and we're scheduled to go to six o'clock. So, and as you know, uh, as you, sh you should know that we are recording this session and we'll be making it available online on our humanealumni.com website later. You'll also be receiving us a, uh, a survey following tonight's webinar. You'll probably get that tomorrow where we'll be asking you for feedback on the survey. Okay, with that, let's get started. Our speaker is, as I said, Dr. Rich Powell, uh, he was, uh, uh, he's been with the university for many years now. He leads a variety of university programs, including the William S. Cohen uh, uh, Institute and the, runs the Congressional Institute program for the university, as well as the state legislative uh, 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 internship program. I should have said the Congressional Internship Program, not the Congressional in Institute. Uh, uh, you read his bio when you registered for this, so I'll spare you a lot of detail there, but we're really proud to have uh, Dr. Powell with us and very proud of all the work he does as a scholar, teacher, uh, and, and public figure, uh, an expert on political science. So Dr. Powell, let's just start with the 15,000 foot level, an overview of uh, the 2020 elections. Uh, uh, what's your interpretation of what happened? Well, that's that's a great question, John. Um, let me first thank you for for inviting me back. Uh, we we did the really neat um, event back in October, and we have some of the same people here. I noted, uh, but it's great to see so many people registered and um, on Zoom right now who are former students and friends and uh, faculty members and staff members and the whole bit here from the university. So so thank you for coming by tonight and. Uh, letting us have a conversation a little bit for the next hour or so. Um, I think obviously everybody's uh, highly attuned to American politics right now, and uh, and it's really a critical time in our in our political history. I think John, we can look at this in a couple different ways, and maybe we can uh, converse about some of these things at different times tonight. I think we can do um, a sort of typical post-election analysis, like we do it would of any uh, presidential election. Uh, campaign, you know, the voter coalitions and how they've changed. Uh, what did voter turnout uh, look like? Uh, what can we make of the campaign strategy that was employed by the candidacies and the efficacy of those strategies? Uh, but, but I think um, maybe even more so this year than any other year, I think we can also have a conversation about uh, what we expect to be the deep 
longer term implications uh, for American government and, and also the place of the United States uh, in the world. So, so I'll start with some of the maybe the more superficial uh, kind of every uh, everyday sorts of things that we would talk about following a presidential election. And then perhaps we can get into some of those deeper, uh, longer term issues um, as we go forward in our conversation. I think um, one thing um, uh, that you would say uh, right off the bat in terms of the results of the election is that really, I think there are causes uh, for celebration for both parties. I, I think, you know, everybody's very much focused on the presidential race, uh, but obviously there were races uh, for many more offices than uh, just the presidency. And so um, obviously Democrats have been um, quite thrilled to have won uh, the presidency. Um, however, I think if, for Republicans, uh, I think Republicans are probably feeling fairly encouraged about the results of the House of Representatives where they picked up seats. That was really um, something that nobody really anticipated. Uh, I mean, I think the, the projections from the best prognosticators were somewhere between a small Democratic pickup and maybe a 20 seat uh, Democratic gain. So, um, so uh, in the House of Representatives, the, the Republicans fared very well. And the Senate, um, we obviously don't know the outcome of uh, the final distribution of seats in the Senate. We're awaiting the runoff, the two runoff elections in, um, in, in uh, Georgia the first week of January. But I think it's safe to say that Republicans did better there uh, than uh, was anticipated by most observers. Uh, the the um, models going into the election showed uh, the Democrats with something like about a 75% chance of picking up control of the Senate. And I would, I would drill down just a little bit deeper as well. And, and I uh, focus people's attention on the state level, which has really gotten significantly less attention in the news media, but will be really critical for our political system going forward in the next 10 years. Uh, Republicans really held on uh, to their um, control of, of state legislatures, which is really critical going into this round of redistricting following this year's census and, and will shape the uh, boundaries of congressional uh, districts and also um, state legislative districts for the next 10 years. Uh, that is an effort that um, Eric Holder, the former attorney general and uh, Barack Obama and many other Democrats really put a lot of focus on in the past several years and, and Republicans really did well there. So, so I, you know, I, I think that, um, that, you know, when you take your attention just away from just the uh, presidential level, there really are um, signs that both parties could take away that are uh, relatively positive. The, the, I'll, I'll just make a couple of other quick comments and um, then throw it back to you. I'd also say that one of the really notable things about this election is the turnout. Uh, we've had north of 160 million people participating in this election. Uh, we think it's going to be something like 67 to 70 percent, perhaps even, of, of the eligible uh, voters, which is really the highest voter turnout that we've had um, in, an, in a presidential election since the late 1800s. And that, I think, is a result of the very close competition and the polarization and the very heated politics that we have right now, which is quite similar to the system that we had uh, during that time in the late night, uh, excuse me, late 1800s. So uh, there are some uh, really significant things that have happened in this election beyond uh, just the uh, presidential election. Um. What about uh, in, here in Maine? Uh, you mentioned the uh, the state level. I know you're not talking just about Maine. You're talking about all the states and the reapportionment process there. What about Maine? Uh, your general overview of what happened in Maine? Well, I mean, I, when we talk about what happened in Maine, I think the number one thing that people are focused on there, obviously, is the Senate race that we had um, here in the state, which attracted uh, considerable national and international attention. Uh, and in which obviously um, Speaker Gideon uh, was in the lead in pretty much all of the public polling uh, throughout 2020. Uh, so, so the result um, turned out to be quite a surprise for people who were uh, following those, those polls. Um, and I think you know, we're gonna have to uh, spend quite a bit of time as political scientists and political observers uh, looking, at, looking to see uh, where the polls were off and 
why in fact um, Senator Collins had such a really overwhelmingly strong performance um, in the face of some um, pretty gloomy uh, polling for her. I, I have, you know, I've started to think about that and we can, we can hazard some hypotheses. I, I don't think we know the answers yet. I do wonder as some other people have observed um, how much uh, the, the excessive spending that we had in the state may have actually affected the race in some ways that people hadn't anticipated. I know um, some folks have commented in the media recently that, that perhaps there was so much saturation on the airwaves. I mean, it seemed that every single commercial uh, in 2020 uh, on our local TV stations concerned the Senate race that perhaps uh, there was some backlash against that. Perhaps people were just frankly sick of the race and um, sick of hearing about it and um, felt um, perhaps invaded by the oversaturation. I mean, we had, we had you know, something like $200 million of spending come into the state of Maine. And Maine is a really cheap, uh, is filled with really cheap media markets. $200 million goes a long, long way as we all saw uh, in, um, in Maine. The, uh, beyond the Senate race, I would say that you see uh, the continued strengthening of this concept that people have talked about for generations in uh, Maine politics, and that's this concept of the two Maines. Uh, it, it's very clear that, uh, that the southern part of the state and the northern part of the state are continuing to diverge in the way that they uh, view uh, politics and many other uh, major uh, features of our um, social context. So I think that's a continued story that we're going to want to continue to watch in coming years as well. You know, the old saying that all politics is local uh, seems to uh, could be part of that that uh, assessment that people are doing about especially about the main Senate race because the net it, it appeared that nationally there, there were people who were trying to nationalize the main Senate race both because of the stakes to both parties but also the uh, uh, the implications for control of the Senate. Senate, do you see that uh, in, in talking with your colleagues and your own assessment? Do you see that as being a factor that people uh, looked at the nationalization of the race and felt either turned off or energized by it? Well, I think there was some nationalization of that, but but I also would probably draw our attention to just the wider historical context in Maine. In Maine, this is true in all states, but in Maine especially, it's really really hard to beat an incumbent. And Maine does not have much experience um, in terms of turning uh, really well-known incumbents um, out of office. We do have some exceptions um, in our political history, but they're relatively few and, and far, betwe far between. So I, I, you know, we were dealing with uh, a person who has been in um, office for over 20 years and uh, for most of that time was one of the most popular senators in the United States Senate. And so you do wonder, um, you know, how much of that was a, the nationalization of the race that you were talking about, but also um, a, a bit of um, Senator Collins' ability to draw upon uh, that very significant long-term uh, goodwill that she had with the voters of Maine that have propelled her to um, so many really significant victories. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the polling, both at the national level and at the state level. Let, let's, if we could talk about polling at the national level, what uh, pollsters got right and perhaps how that had a, an effect on how the pundits and the public felt about the direction of the, the election and what could be. Sure, I think, you know, for the second election in a row, uh, national election, people are really feeling a lack of confidence in our system of public opinion polling right now. We had a chance to talk about that in um, October at our webinar that we did then. And um, it, it had seemed that pollsters had worked out a great many of the bugs that they had experienced in 2016 and the 2018 uh, elections uh, polling performed actually much better across the country than it had in 2000. 16. But again, um, this year you had a pretty significant polling error, about 2.5% uh, nationally. Um, Biden was predicted, obviously, uh, in the polls to win by a more significant margin than he did. But it is worth um, noting that he still did win 
by uh, probably we're, you know, we're still counting votes, but somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4% and um, something like 6 million votes. So, you know, they, they didn't get it completely wrong, although the margin was off. But nevertheless, we do find that in a number of the states, the state polling uh, was off uh, pretty considerably. And that's true again in those key uh, upper Midwestern states, which showed Biden in the polls with a really substantial lead uh, that, and he ended up winning those three key states that we talked about last time, but uh, by much smaller margins than people had anticipated. So uh, pollsters are really trying to figure this out. And, and I think um, if we are going to have uh, confidence in our polling system, they're going to have to do that. And, and I, polling just plays such a critical role in our uh, society. And it's the way that we are able to figure out the meaning of elections and also to figure out what the public wants between elections, that it really is critical that we, that we sort this out. I, I really think that one of the key questions that pollsters are trying to wrestle with is, is there something that's uh, permanently uh, broken with our, our uh, technology when it comes to uh, public opinion polling? Or is there simply something going on that's uh, particular to the phenomenon surrounding uh, uh, President Trump? And is there something um, unique about him and um, his supporters and his, his candidacies that are uh, distorting the poll? So I think we really need to um, sort that out. There is some um, initial um, speculation about this uh, based on first cuts of the data uh, that it, it does appear uh, we, you know, somebody asked in October, you know, what do we think of this concept of the shy Trump voter, this idea that uh, the president's supporters are, are less likely to um, be willing to share with um, pollsters that they support the president. And there, there was very little evidence of that um, in the past several years. And I still think there's relatively little evidence for that. But there may be a phenomenon that, that sort of emerged in which uh, supporters of the president are just much less likely to answer polls, not because they're um, embarrassed to say they support the president, but because they have less trust in traditional institutions. Uh, they um, just are, are less likely to want to speak to uh, pollsters, which tend to represent large media organizations or large institutions in our society. And there might be something going on there where they're just less willing to answer the call and to talk to pollsters in the first place. But these, these are the sorts of things that um, public opinion pollsters really need to sort out because uh, we are really um, cut loose in a uh, fairly uh, scary way if we can't make sense of public opinion in a uh, large representative democracy like the United States. This wasn't, or this year and 2016 weren't the only uh, examples of pollsters being off the mark. Can you provide a little bit of a historical context I, going back to the FDR election? Well, sure. I mean, historically, there have been some very embarrassing uh, mistakes made by pollsters, um, especially in the early years of public opinion polling, uh, where um, it was not fully understood uh, that you had to have a representative sample and uh, a random sample and what that meant and, you know, reliance on some technologies like telephones even, which um, in the early years tended to uh, distort the findings of polls because it turned out back then that, you know, only people of a certain demographic tended to own telephones. Um, those were really worked out fairly significantly and polling went through a very long stretch uh, for decades of actually being quite accurate in terms of its ability to predict the outcome of elections. When, whenever you get a really close election, uh, polling is not necessarily going to be able to accurately uh, predict the results of those. But, but I, you know, I think polling is just so critical because it helps us to figure out kind of the broad um, themes and um, the public's attitudes about a wide range of issues. It tells us of, uh, how we can interpret the outcome of elections. And, um, and for many decades, uh, we had quite a lot of confidence, and especially, you know, in the, in the last um, elections leading up to uh, 2016 and, and um, 2020. I mean, 20, um, 2008 and 2012, um, pollsters really were amazingly accurate uh, in, their, um, in their findings. 
the uh, a lot of the post-election uh, uh, feedback or or uh, post-mortem that have been discussed on cable TV shows and in the uh, in other media have talked about assumptions that uh, that were made, especially by Democrats, and assuming that certain demographic groups were were would uh, support Biden or support Trump uh, as a monolith. And it uh, looks like uh, that didn't happen. I'm thinking of Latinx voters in, uh, in Florida versus uh, the Texas border and in Southern California. What are political scientists talking about the, the fact that there seemed to be a lot wrong with the assumptions? Well, that's a great point, John. And I think political scientists are gonna be very busy over the next three or four years trying to sort that out. Um, as you correctly observed, uh, there are some significant divergences that took place in um, the demographic uh, distributions of the vote this year that weren't necessarily foreseen. I, you know, I think humans always have um, an inherent bias towards um, over-trusting trends. When people look at trend lines, they, they just, kind of assume that those trends are going to continue. And we know obviously that trends don't continue, uh, that, that things change and, um, and society is complex. And, and that emerged when you look this year. I, now, so, so when you look at what happened this year in terms of the demographics, some of the trends that, um, that we anticipated turned out to be absolutely correct. Um, and, and you look at um, the, the voting that took place in the different demographic groups. Um, uh, Vice President Biden did uh, very well with um, suburban women. He did very well with college educated voters, outperformed uh, where Hillary Clinton was four years with these, um, with these voters. He did, he did very, very well with independents and moderates, something that we expected. He did very well with Catholic voters, a major, major swing group um, in um, American elections, one of the most important swing groups. But as you noted, there were some really major surprises. Um, for example, um, uh, Latinos, especially especially um, men um, in certain areas of the country, moved in President Trump's direction over um, the last election, and I think very few people uh, picked up on that um, as a as a possibility. You saw that especially in South Florida, but but um, the um, the Hispanic population in South Florida is unique in the United States, so. So um, that's not, the, the degree was a surprise, but uh, the trend wasn't necessarily surprising there. But this also extended into some border areas of Texas and some other areas of the United States. Uh, another major shift, uh, not in terms of magnitude so much, but, um, but a shift that, that took place that was notable was the increase um, in support for President Trump among African American men, um, something that really was not uh, foreseen all that much. Uh, President Trump did better with Asian American voters, it appears, in this election. Um, and, um, and people are, are attempting to sort that out. Again, I think there are some preliminary hypotheses about way that, why that may be the case. I think um, one that uh, may prove to hold some weight is the fact that um, many of these voters um, appear in, in the initial exit polls to have been influenced by uh, their perce perceptions about uh, President Trump's management of the economy pre-coronavirus, uh, uh, where they felt that, um, that he had actually done quite well in managing the economy during that period of time, and they don't hold him necessarily accountable uh, for the um, decline in the economy this year. And in fact, they, in some instances, uh, may actually um, think that his approach economically to the coronavirus is something that they approve of in the sense that he's been somewhat less resistant to, um, to shutting down economies or um, closing the closing of businesses and so on. And so one of the hypotheses is that um, voters um, who, are, um, who have less financial uh, resources were perhaps more swayed by President Trump's performance on the economy. Whereas if you look at uh, more affluent suburban voters and um, and, and college-educated voters and things of that nature, um, there, there's a hypothesis that maybe they were um, more free to vote against somebody um, whose personality they happen to object to 
um, in, in a way that they didn't have to be quite as sensitive to their uh, perceived economic self-interest. There seems to be uh, some uh, disbelief uh, on the part of a lot of Americans, a lot of division as we're all aware of, but a lot of it seems to track according to media consumption preferences, no surprise. Mm -hmm. And it's not just people who watch Fox, uh, it's people who watch MSNBC. And uh, there, there is, as a lot of people have talked about, a different sense of what is real there. And it's obviously carrying over post-election now. We were talking before we started about uh, a story that reported 77% of people who voted for President Trump feel the election was stolen to some degree. And there are others uh, you know, on the other side who feel that uh, they have their own feelings about who was uh, to blame and what was stolen. How do you, as, as somebody who's an expert in, in political science, interpret uh, the attitudes, beliefs of, of people who are seeing filtered messages and have have uh, adopted that as something that really seems to be addressing the future of democracy. This is absolutely, uh, John, one of the most worrisome things in our political system um, in, in recent years, the extent to which people are living in their own informational bubbles, uh, where we don't just have disagreements about policy or about politics anymore, but we actually disagree on what the facts are and what reality looks like. That is not something that we had to experience um, in, in recent decades before the emergence of the current um, news system. So, you know, you're, you mentioned um, this finding of, it's actually been replicated in multiple polls this week, uh, that 70% that or more of Republicans uh, say that, um, that Joe Biden won the election due to cheating. Um, and despite, you know, really no credible evidence yet that has emerged that um, that that's the case, uh, but um, that obviously very sensitive to the media and environment that's very dominated by uh, the president and their co-partisans. Uh, you mentioned Fox News. Fox News actually has fewer viewers right now than they did about a week or two ago uh, because um, they they projected the race for Joe Biden. And um, there's been a huge uptick in the in the number of viewers who have defected from uh, Fox News and gone over to Newsmax um, in the past week. Newsmax has seen its viewership um, increase by, by in, in the hundreds of percentage uh, range in the, in the last um, seven to 10 days uh, because they are carrying a much more reliably um, pro-Trump message. Uh, but, but you know, I, I tell students all the time, I think the best thing you can do is to really um, try to focus on your media diet. You know, there's, there's uh, media, if we think of it as a diet, there's junk food out there uh, that's not very good for you. And um, there's, there's your, you know, your broccoli also. And, and I think um, the partisan news media in which people are existing in echo chambers and only hear the viewpoints with which they already agree is extremely dangerous uh, for our democratic system. It's not the only thing that explains the level of polarization that we have right now, but it is absolutely one of the chief contributors. Uh, political science research over the last decade or so has, has borne this out uh, time and time again. There have been some really interesting experiments um, in psychology where they've replicated these sorts of experiences. And uh, these, these echo chambers, these informational bubbles are, are really very, very dangerous, I think, uh, for uh, the future of democracy in the United States. I don't know what the solution is. I wish I did, um, but um, it's it's a it's a huge problem, no doubt. A reminder to folks: if you have questions for Professor Powell, just type them. Uh, just click on the chat button and type in your question, and make sure you hit the return or enter key, and uh, we'll get to them. We've had a lot of good questions here. I'm going to uh, go through some of them now. Uh, 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 one of our uh, attendees tonight is asking, do you think this year's election results indicate uh, a high watermark, a peak in partisan polarization, and how can this be remedied, if at all? Um, you know, I'd like to think they do, but I, 
I'm, I'm not confident of that. I, I did say earlier, you know, we tend to overestimate um, trend lines, and we've had periods of hyper uh, polarization in previous eras of American politics uh, that that ended, but they usually only end um, following some sort of major, oftentimes catastrophic event. Um, so, um, you know, I, I guess I would not be betting in the short run that our polarization um, is going to be subsiding anytime soon, because, um, you know, if, if for no other reason, I think the um, president has made it quite clear that he intends to remain a major player on the political stage and he intends to maintain his position as a leader of the Republican Party. So I mean, he's, he's even been talking about the possibility with his advisors of announcing his um, 2024 candidacy uh, within the next few weeks. So, um, so you know, I, you know I, 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 would, I wish it were the case, but I just don't see um, the, the promise of a decrease in our polarization uh, at this point. If you look at all of the things that are fueling this polarization, uh, none of them are reversing course, at, at least in, in the short run. So, I, I, you know, I, I've been asked this question many, many times over the last uh, five to 10 years, um, you know, what will bring an end to the level of polarization? And I tend to think that it will be some sort of major, um, major world event, uh, major national event that really reshapes the way people uh, look at the United States and its place in the world. Uh, when, when coronavirus first surfaced this year, I, I did toy with the idea for a week or two about whether or not this could be such an event, and it pretty became pretty clear that that even became a polarizing uh, political issue when it wasn't apparent initially that it would be so. I mean, it, there, was, there was no inherent reason why a coronavirus and a response to coronavirus would, uh, would divide along party lines, but, um, but people's attitudes about coronavirus and what government ought to do fairly quickly fell in line with um, their uh, party's leaders once those party leaders started taking clear stands on how to respond. So um, I wish I could be more optimistic, but, um, but I don't see the end in sight yet um, in terms of uh, polarization. Well, related to that, we have uh, several questions that ask about the polarization of the Senate. And of course, we don't know what's going to happen with the two Georgia Senate seats, but uh, how do you see uh, the new Senate, whether it's uh, controlled by the Republicans or controlled by the Democrats with the uh, vice president elect uh, uh, being the tiebreaker, do you see a change in the dynamics uh, or the relationships of the, of the Senate based on what has happened in the last four years and in particular during the last year where it seemed like most people would say very little got accomplished? So I would say, um regardless of how the two races turn out in Georgia. I think um, progressives um, have cause to be extremely disappointed about the outcome of, of this year's election. I think, I think the progressive agenda as it was envisioned uh, with a sweeping uh, victory assumed by Joe Biden and, and Democrats in the Senate and the House is, is that was always going to be a difficult one, even if Democrats controlled the Senate. But I think that's just flat out dead at this point um, for, for at least the next two years. Even if, even if um, the Democrats were to pick up the two uh, Georgia seats and you had a 50-50 split and you had um, Vice President Harris breaking tie votes um, in the Senate, there are enough um, uh, sort of moderate Senate institutionalists on the Democratic side who are not going to go along with, um, you know, packing the Supreme Court or expanding the size of the Supreme Court or ending the filibuster or you know passing the Green New Deal and so on and so forth. So, um, so I think in terms of um, larger implications for policy, I think it's very important. There's a there's a big difference between a United States Senate where the parties uh, are either very closely divided or the Republicans have a majority uh, versus a United States Senate in which the Democrats. Um, would have controlled 53 or 54 seats. I think many of those things you might have seen uh, move forward. So I, 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 you know, people have been speculating, well, you know, um, 
Joe Biden is a creature of the Senate and has known Mitch McConnell and so on and so forth for many decades. And so they're going to want to sit down and make some deals. And I think there probably will be some space for that sort of thing if Mitch McConnell uh, stays as the majority leader. Uh, but I would not expect it on major um, issues of, of contention in American politics. I mean, I think there's some space on things like, um, you know, like stimulus bills and uh, maybe on infrastructure and um, and things of that nature, but um, I, I I don't think so because I don't think the incentives are there, especially with uh, for as long as um, um, Donald Trump remains the dominant figure in the Republican Party, uh, and Republican senators are um, frightened to um, to take any positions that are contrary to his. I just think that there's there's very little wiggle room for them. Uh, to um, do things in a way that's significantly different from from what they've been doing. Um, even if even if they uh, wanted to do that deep down, I think the consequences uh, for them of um, defying the base are electorally just too great to think that many of them are going to engage in that sort of bipartisan negotiation. We've got several good questions and again, keep them coming, but here's an interesting one. Uh, when we were talking about the news uh, uh, and news consumption, uh, somebody wrote, where's the news broccoli? Using your references, <laughs> I think that's healthy. It says, I'm trying to listen to various degrees of left and right and I'm finding bias and can't determine where the truth lies. Maybe we could start with, obviously as a political scientist, you're consuming everything you can get your hands on. But what do you view when you're talking to your students? What do you view as reliable news sources? That's a great question. There's a, the students ask about this all the time. Um, and they don't have a lot of experience picking out um, news sources because so much of what they're getting is through social media and, and whatnot nowadays, which, which actually much of that news does come from traditional news sources just in social media feeds. Um, but um, there's, a, there's a wonderful um, graphic that's floated around in several iterations on the internet since about 2015 or 2016 that um, sort of looks at this two-dimensional view of, of uh, major media providers in the United States um, from a, from a, on one axis from a left to right continuum and um, on the other from sort of, um, you know, um, wild, fantasy, wild fantasy to fact-based reporting. And it, and it kind of organizes the, all, all the um, common news media along that. I actually find it a fairly um, accurate um, representation of the news sources. So, you know, I, I tend to try to look at um, news sources that are very high on the sort of factual content and, um, and fairly nonpartisan. Um, in their in in their um, political viewpoints, and then I try to balance that out with some of the really high quality um, sources of news on the left and the right. Um, you know, I think that that on in, in both left and right, there are some really high quality thought thoughtful places to um, to look. Um, so you know, I I tend to look at. Um, yeah, I, I recommend that people watch PBS NewsHour. I mean, it gets very low viewership, but it's, you know, in, in my subjective uh, viewpoint, a wonderful news broadcast. I personally watch a lot of uh, BBC on, um, on, on my cable, but also on, um, on the uh, shows that air on, on PBS. But then, you know, I'll, I'll look at some of the other uh, perspectives. Like if you want to look at something that leans a little bit to the right, you can certainly look at the Wall Street Journal. You can look at the Economist magazine. And I think these are, you know, reputable, um, responsible, journalistic enter enterprises for the most part. And then I think you can find the same sorts of things on the left, whether it be um, the Atlantic or, um, you know, several other similar sorts of publications. But I generally um, try to get my students to avoid the um, the really sort of irresponsible conspiracy theory uh, laced stuff on the right and the left, um, and um, you know, and try to try to avoid those. And and just the the for me, just the flat out partisan uh, media doesn't hold much use for me. Um, I, you know, it's it when you have arrived at your conclusions before you even start reporting a particular story, I think you're probably going off down the wrong track. 
several uh, news outlets have uh, fact checkers. And uh, there are, so there are some that are associated with uh, media outlets, but there are also some independent ones like Snopes and uh, uh, like uh, pulling and uh, forgetting some of the others. But uh, are you, which of the fact checking uh, sources do you find to be most credible? Oh, that's a good question. I don't actually look at a lot of those independently. I, I do pay attention to the fact checkers that appear in the major news sources, some of which I mentioned. Uh, but I, I don't tend to seek out personally um, some of the um, specialized websites that, that do the fact checking. I, I look at them from time to time, but it's not a big source of um, of information for me. That that might just be a function of the fact that sort of I'm steeped in this all day, every day. So, um, you know, a, as a professional political scientist specializing in American politics, um, I probably have a perspective where I can do fact checking kind of live on my on my own um, better than you know people who are busy with their lives doing other sorts of things. Yeah. I've got a few questions uh, uh, about going back to Maine. And uh, basically, questions about the role of Maine's uh, delegation, particularly uh, our two senators, going forward in the new in the new Congress. Uh, the, uh, the clout that Senator Collins will have if uh, the Republicans maintain control of the Senate. The possibility of Senator King moving into the Biden administration. Could you talk about how? the new Congress and the new administration could affect Maine and Maine's clout in Washington? Yeah, and John, I think that this was, this is a great question. Um, I think we might've touched on this back in October too when we were talking about the Maine Senate race, but I, I actually think that this played a role in um, the vote choice of many Mainers when they went to the polls. Um, having the one-two punch of um, Senator Collins perhaps being the chair of the Senate Appropriations um, Committee or, or being the ranking member in a very closely divided Senate and with um, Representative Shelley Pingree on the House Appropriations Committee um, is, is really important for the state of Maine. Um, I, I think that dynamic uh, will continue to bring um, much spending to uh, the state of Maine on really critical issues. And I think that'll benefit not just the state, but um, likely the University of Maine also. So I, I do think that's critical. We, we don't know what's going to hap happen, um, of course, with Representative Pingree. She's being discussed as a potential cabinet member as well, um, as has um, been, as you noted, um, Senator King, who's, whose name has been floated quite prominently this week uh, for um, the position of Director of National Intelligence, a position which she would certainly be well qualified to step into. Um, given his experience on the um, Senate Intelligence Committee these past years, um, and also his experience in being a senator and a, and a two-term governor. So, um, you know, I, I think we'll have to see how that shakes out um, and, and what would happen with um, that particular um, Senate seat. He has really carved out an important role, um, especially when it comes to um, foreign affairs and intelligence issues, but also uh, through his role on the um, on the energy committee. Um, so, so that we'll have to see how that particular dynamic plays out. But I do think that the, um, the main delegation has always played an outsized role. It's always uh, punched above its weight in national politics. And I don't see any reason uh, to think that that is going to change. I, I will note that um, somebody joked to me um, when it appeared um, in the days right following the election that the Republicans would maintain uh, at least narrow control of the uh, United States Senate. We, we have to see whether that will happen. But somebody joked to me, well, it looks like the next two years uh, that the United States will be governed by Joe Biden, Mitt Romney, and Susan Collins. And, and, um, and I chuckled, and obviously that's an oversimplification, but, but I, I do think that we have... Um, two senators in the United States, regardless of what the ads um, say in the, in the various Senate races that we have, who do uh, vote with their uh, political party less than just about any other um, members of, of the Senate and who are really among the most independent minded uh, senators in, in the United States Senate and in a closely divided Senate, 
that really puts them in a very important position, regardless of the particular committee assignments that they have that, uh, that are uh, of such benefit to the state. When you mentioned that the university itself might be a beneficiary of Maine's political clout, could you just to elaborate on that, could you give a little bit of a historical context about why having them in those positions, even though the rules have changed from the old days where, uh, where you had Robert Byrd and others just packing, sending off money in bucket loads to their home states, uh, you know, in the last 20 years because of uh, Professor George Jacobson and some other faculty members who really got the university fired up and working on uh, uh, R&D uh, as a part of the university enterprise, that's really become a very important element to the university. How can the Senate and our congressional members uh, help that and do it in a way that isn't simply pushing pork uh, in the direction of Maine or the university? Well, that's great. And, and actually, um, I think, I think um, George is probably on this conference call uh, or on this, on this webcast. Uh, he, he could speak to that with um, much more expertise than I could, with something we've talked about quite a bit. Um, but as a major research university, and as a university that's um, in, hand, in the process of enhancing its research capabilities, uh, much of uh, what we do uh, really depends upon uh, federal support and state support in terms of our, our research mission, um, in terms of um, research facilities, in terms of fi financing important cutting edge research in areas um, um, like climate change and like um, renewable energy sources and, and in many other areas. Um, you know, you mentioned the term sort of pork, and I would actually say, you know, pork is usually what people term um, the stuff that goes to everybody else, but not to their own particular, um, their own particular area. And uh, the state of Maine and the University of Maine and um, the United States are a lot better off because of the research dollars that have flowed to the, United, to, to the University of Maine and the really superb uh, scientific research that has taken place on our campus um, to really make major contributions in these areas. So, um, you know, those are really, those are really important um, functions of a land grant research university and, and um, government dollars are an important part of the equation. Shifting over, we've had several questions asking about uh, the role of the Electoral College uh, this year and in past years and the calls for reform of it or abol abolition of it. Obviously, it's part of the Constitution and complete abolition of it would take a constitutional amendment. But what are the possibilities? Do you or do you see other states looking at what Maine has done and that is to divide its Electoral College votes according to congressional district and what could that mean? So obviously this has been, you know, a discussion that we've had quite a bit over the course of American politics, but especially in the last 10 years and even more so in the last four years. And, and obviously many, many people uh, now are opposed to the idea of the electoral college. They think it distorts the outcomes of our elections. Um, my, my short answer is in terms of changing the electoral college um, at a national level, it's not gonna happen. Um, it, it requires a constitutional amendment uh, which would require the support of three quarters of the states and, and just um, not going to get um, three quarters of the states to vote to change the Electoral College. There are some intermediary things that states can do. They can move to a system like Maine and Nebraska, uh, whereby um, you, you divide up your electoral votes with a portion going to the statewide vote and then others going on some sort of a district allocation. Um, there's also a number of states that are participating in a compact uh, whereby they've enacted laws that if a certain number of states also agree, they will willingly uh, cast their electoral votes for the winner of the, uh, national, um, the national vote. Mm -hmm. um, and that has maybe perhaps a little bit more of, an, uh, of a possibility of um, taking place, but that really still depends upon states choosing to do that on their own. And so I think at best you probably get, you know, a portion of states that would decide to do that and other states would retain their uh, current uh, procedures for determining their electoral votes. So um, it's something that vexes a lot of people. I, I, I don't see any real significantly uh, likely avenue for doing all that much about the electoral college. 
uh, in, in the foreseeable future. Have you uh, looked at any breakdowns of what would happen, what the electoral vote would have been if it were um, determined this year according to congressional district as opposed to states? Because that would that would obviously change the distribution of electors. Yeah, I haven't looked at that. That would be relatively easy to find. I think probably we could probably Google it and get and find the answer to that. You know, within mm -hmm. five minutes. I I don't know the answer. To that. I have not. Uh, yeah taken a look at that since our since our election took place this year. Yeah, I've seen a map that breaks it down by county nationally, and it gives you a very different picture of the red versus blue uh, by county. And, uh, you know, we're all somebody mentioned in a question, you know, we're so accustomed to seeing the, the red states and the blue states and most of the red states being right in the in the center of the country in the heartland. But if you break it down by county, it's a very different picture. And uh, so uh, something that uh, is worth looking into if folks, if you're, you're into that sort of thing. You know, we talked earlier about the demographic changes taking place and trying to predict whether or not those are changes that are permanent um, or are they, they particular to Donald Trump. Um, you know, we can ask the same questions about, about geography. Uh, Professor Brewer and I do a lot of work on this after each uh, round of presidential election. And, um, and there are some interesting trends taking place right now in, in the geographic distribution of our uh, votes for party. And we, we see these take place generationally in American politics. If you look at the changes between uh, the 1950s and 1960s and, and the 2000s, they're pretty pronounced um, in terms of the geographic vote. And, and interestingly, some of those trends, at least partially, are reversing themselves. We see the Democrats uh, being much more competitive in some areas in the South. Obviously, Georgia this year was uh, the major example of that, but also Arizona, which has been a Republican state um, for a long time. Uh, we saw a more competitive Texas, not anywhere near uh, the level that Democrats were kind of hoping for. And on the flip side, we see Republicans being competitive in places that uh, really they haven't been competitive in recent years. Pennsylvania has become you know, kind of the preeminent swing state. And that was a real solid uh, democratic state. But, you know, you could certainly envision uh, Republicans in the going forward doing well in Wisconsin and Michigan again. Ohio, which was uh, sort of the quintessential swing state is really no longer a swing state. It, it appeared like it might be for the first hour or two when the election returns came in this year. But, but Ohio has become a very comfortable state for Republicans. So, so Republicans seem to be really excelling in that in the, in the upper Midwest in particular, while at the same time, Democrats are making gains um, in um, some places in the South that they have not been competitive in recent years. Good. Um, can you address uh, I mean, the, the role of early voting and the ease of voting that uh, the pandemic brought on, but the, uh, I, do you see that as being the way voting will be conducted in the future? Is that, has, even though right now we're seeing disputes over that uh, related to this recent election, what is the future of election day becoming election month and being a postal month? I, I think that's um, almost certainly going to happen. It's not gonna happen everywhere in the United States. There will be states that resist that. Uh, but, but you know, we've all been trying to think about in our whole lives, what are those areas in which our lives have changed this year due to coronavirus that um, they will become permanently changed. And I think you're correct about the um, changes that have taken place in voting. Maine has always been a state where it's been incredibly easy to vote. And Maine has always had one of the highest rates of voter turnout anywhere in the United States. So this won't be perhaps as big of a change uh, for the state of Maine, but I think people probably got quite used to um, the ease and the convenience of being able to vote by mail and being able to vote uh, with expanded um, in-person voting uh, prior to election day. So I think that's a trend that's absolutely here to stay. And that was a part of what drove our high turnout this year. It's, it's, the, it's the polarization and the high level of interest, but it's also um, the changes that were made that have made it easier for people to vote. Somebody asked the question, does, did the fact that the whole idea of early voting became 
uh, a, a point of partisan contention among the presidential candidates, not so much, I believe, at the you know down ballot. But um, what what impact do you think that had on the outcome of the election? People talk a lot about how it benefited Joe Biden, but also and that it uh, 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 was a detriment to the campaign of President Trump. How how do you view that? And what is I the well, you know, I don't, I, I don't think that's the, it's true that early voting and the people who voted um, early strongly tilted in favor of Biden. There's no doubt about that. Um, and there was a, there was a much stronger tilt towards um, President Trump for those who turned out on election day. We saw that everywhere in the, when the votes were being, um, were being counted. But what I think was notable about this year's election is that both sides turned out their voters. Um, so Democrats were very successful at um, playing up that early voting and, and increasing their turnout, but uh, the president increased turnout among his supporters substantially as well. Uh, so, you know, we really had just kind of two um, ways of voting that both turned out to be very popular among their own particular uh, partisans. I don't know that that will last um, beyond, beyond this, it may. Um, but there's there's not a it, it's not necessarily clear why that should be the case in the long run. But voting has in laws about voting have, as you know, divided along party lines for um, for decades now in American politics. If we go back to disputes in the 1990s about motor voter bills and you know before that with um, the Voting Rights Act and and many other um, voting reforms. So so the the debate about voting access between the parties is nothing particularly new in our political system. Yeah, a couple of questions about ranked choice voting. Maine has it, it didn't come into play uh, this year. Um, uh, I think Massachusetts turned it down and Alaska, I believe, passed it. Um, but what is the future of ranked choice voting? Well, it's great that you asked that question. And actually we have an alum who might be on this call. He was pre-registered. Uh, a former student of ours, Gordon Merrick, who worked on that issue um, in, in, um, in Alaska and elsewhere. Um, and is, we've been corresponding about that this week. So, you know, Maine has been, a, um, a, a been undertaking an experiment, I think, in terms of ranked choice voting. And uh, it'll be fascinating to see if that spreads to other countries. Oftentimes, you know, people, we call states the laboratories of democracy. And, and many of the reforms that eventually play out at the national level, begin at the state level. I, I, I don't entirely um, understand why ranked choice voting has become a partisan issue nationally or even in the state. Um, I, I do understand the context in which ranked choice voting emerged in Maine um, carried the perception that it was uh, designed to benefit um, Democrats and hurt people on the right, but there's no particular reason that that is necessarily true in the long run. And I think, you know, political scientists who have uh, been looking at this in recent years have identified places that ranked choice voting would actually benefit Republicans. Um, I mean, and in fact, if you look at if you look at um, the Georgia races right now, um, it, it's quite possible that if you had gone to a ranked choice si system instead of this. Um, special uh, runoff election that Republicans might have won those um, Senate seats on the ranked choice count in, in the state of Georgia. So it's something that's become politicized um, that, that isn't necessarily, um, at least in my mind, something that breaks down along conservative or liberal lines. It's just a method of, of voting that could help or hurt candidates um, in either party, depending upon the set of local circumstances. We have uh, I'd like to get back to a point you made earlier, and that is the state of democracy. Several mm -hmm. people have asked about that. From a from your standpoint as a political scientist, somebody who's in in the the network of political scientists, how would you assess the the stability of democracy in the United States right now? I mean, at this moment and in the foreseeable future. And the things, the things that have to be done in order to make sure that it's stabilized and that uh, it's it's uh, protected from extremes on either end of the spectrum. 
Well, John, I, in my view, that's actually the most important question about all of you know what, what we've been going through in recent years in this particular election. And I think um, it would be a mistake to look at 2020 and think that those concerns um, are no longer with us. Uh, there's been a, a wonderful book that's come out that I would recommend to people um, the, in just the past um, several months by a former colleague of mine, Suzanne Mettler, along with a, a co-author of hers. And the name of the book is Four Threats, uh, The Recurring Crises of American Democracy. And it's a really wonderful historical look at these questions about where we are in terms of American democracy. And um, as they point out in this book, many of the things that we're experiencing now, we have experienced before. So we were talking about political polarization. We are obviously in a phase of very high political polarization, but we have had those in the past. Um, we've had a lot of focus uh, this year in particular on issues of racism and nativism. These have been recurring issues uh, throughout American history. Uh, we have had a lot of attention on economic inequality um, in recent years in American politics. And we've had periods of um, high economic inequality in the past. And the last one they mention is excessive executive authority, uh, concentration of authority uh, within executives. And that's something that we've experienced before as well. And these things tend to wax and wane. However, they do observe that while we have had all of these things and they've all posed significant threats to democracy in the past, we have never had a period in American politics in which we experienced all four of those things at the same time. Um, so I think we still have some pretty serious threats um, going forward. And uh, I, I think you still see it in the news every day. In fact, before I came on this, a particular webinar, I was, um, you know, reading the headlines and saw that um, the, the president has invited state legislators from Michigan uh, to the White House to uh, presumably talk about uh, doing something uh, with uh, appointing an alternate state of electors, perhaps from the state of Michigan. So, I, you know, I, I, I am, I still think um, we have some particular issues that we need to be very aware of. And I don't think we are um, necessarily um, in a place that we can let down our guard and be optimistic in terms, from, in terms of the state of democracy. I, you know, I'll mention another book um, that people might want to take a look at, a book that's got a lot, gotten a lot of attention in recent years, a book called How Democracies Die uh, by a Harvard political science a scientist, Stephen Levitsky, and a co-author. Um, and they examine the fall of democracies around the world in recent decades. And they argue that democracy, even in a country where it has existed uh, for centuries in the United States, is, is never quite safe. Uh, that, that democracies rely not just on constitutional and legal means, but they rely on a very widespread acceptance of democratic norms, uh, the legitimacy of one's opposition, um, you know, viewing the opposition as the opposition, not as, uh, as mortal enemies, um, having forbearance, uh, when the other party uh, wins, uh, acceding um, power when you lose, uh, the rule of law, uh, respect for mediating institutions like the courts and, and, um, and um, uh, prosecutorial offices and, um, and respecting mediating institutions like the press. I mean, I think we are clearly uh, very much um, at threat in terms of many of these things in the United States. I'm hopeful, um, I, would, I would bet that the United States will, would work through this, but I don't think that's a foregone conclusion. And the United States, I think would be well served to learn the lessons uh, that have played out in other countries around the world where there were thriving democracies and where um, those countries have taken significant steps away from democracies in recent years. Uh, I, I think that's something that needs to be earned by each and every generation of Americans. And, and, be, and we're still being tested with that, I think, now. Well, Dr. Rich Powell, thank you so much. Uh, there's a reason why Dr. Powell was selected as the 2020 Distinguished Maine Professor Honoree. And uh, uh, we're, we thank you for sharing your expertise with us and for everything you do for the university and for its students. Thank you, well, so, thank much. you so much for having me. I enjoyed it.
Sure. Folks, our next, there are lots of, I can see people on my screen applauding. <laughs> so, uh, our next uh, webinar will be on December 9th. A uh, very different topic. We have Professor Derek Nishu of the philosophy department, uh, who's going to be talking about world religions and the importance of the month of December to many world religions. So you'll be, everybody on this call, on this Zoom will be getting an invitation about that as well, but it'll be appropriate uh, in December. And, uh, and uh, a change of pace from what uh, we've all been experiencing through the political season and through the COVID season. So again, uh, thank you all for participating, for joining us tonight. You'll be receiving an email asking you to uh, uh, fill out a survey, an online survey about this, uh, this uh, webinar and suggesting other topics for us. And I encourage you all to stay healthy and enjoy your Thanksgiving and to take care. So good evening, everybody.